911, what's your emergency? When 911 calls started coming in about a car swerving across the interstate, some claimed that no one was in the driver's seat. Others claimed they had seen two Caucasian men jumping out of the car and running into the woods. Though, this car belonged to a now missing biracial teenager who didn't match any of those descriptions. With two other teenage disappearances occurring in the area, this case is beyond mysterious. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Rick McKenna, and today's case is about Logan Schendelman and his extremely suspicious disappearance that really has not had much as far as answers to give. And there's not even a ton of information, but it does get so weird when you learn about how eerily similar other teens have disappeared in this very area. So let's go ahead and jump in. But first, I want to thank our longtime sponsor, Anna Luisa. Anna Luisa had overtaken my jewelry collection with such high quality pieces starting at $39 and having 35% off with my link down below. It makes it so easy to not break the bank while looking sophisticated. And for such great prices, these pieces last so incredibly long and they don't tarnish. Like I've told you guys before, I wear mine for months at a time without taking them off and they literally look exactly the same. So if you still need a holiday gift, I would look at the Anna Luisa pieces and see if you can find something for those that you love. And you get their 35% off with my link down below. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 2016 in Washington and Logan Drew Schindelman had been born on June 27th of 1996. Now this was in Tombwater. His father and his mother had never really had an official relationship, just more of a fling, and his father ended up moving out of the United States before he was even born to go back to Saudi Arabia, where he was from. Now, his mother, Hannah, had moved to Seattle not long after his birth to attend art school and asked her mother, Jenny, if Jenny would take care of not only Logan, but also her other daughter, Chloe, who was Logan's half-sister. Hannah was only 23 years old at the time. She was a very young mother and her mother, so their grandmother, agreed to take them in. Now, his father was said to never be in Logan's life and after his visa expired, he had to go back home. He didn't have a choice. Logan's father, as I said, was Saudi Arabian and his mother was African American as well as Caucasian. So Logan was biracial and Logan was said to love his grandmother, Jenny. She treated them just like a mother would. However, it was more difficult for Logan because she was a Caucasian woman and most of the family members that he was around were Caucasian. And so he being mixed race himself didn't have a lot of people to relate to. In fact, the entire town of Tombwater was said you have a very high percentage of Caucasian individuals. Grandma Jenny would say that Logan often experienced an identity crisis due to this, but she also described a Logan as a bright little boy. He was smart, he was funny, and to most people he could be a very sensitive man, but he was also very charismatic around different people, and he would make friends so quickly. He was often at home writing poetry and listening to music and kind of going inward, but around those people, he was able to find that social battery and people loved being around him. But Logan attended Tumwater High School where he was on the football team as a star defensive back. He had friends who would often film silly videos with him. He did great in school and he even helped out his aunt Mary and Uncle Mike on their large farm that they had. He would do chores, he would mow fields, he would clean the barns, and his aunt and uncle said that he was always willing and ready to work. There was no one who didn't like Logan. Now, this was said to change a bit during his senior year of high school. You see, there was a party that Logan was invited to, and while he was there, a girl began to make racist remarks about him. She was saying that he should be dancing around the fire and doing songs because he, he was part Saudi Arabian, and he felt very offended by this, yet none of his friends understood why, and they did not stand up for him at all. And so, for a mixed-race man who was struggling with his identity already, this upset Logan greatly. 
He, in fact, called Jenny to come and pick him up that very moment, and he started cutting off his friends after that and self-isolating. Now, he ended up enrolling in a college which was actually 300 miles away rather than the local college he planned to go to because he just wanted this fresh start. So Logan was accepted into the Washington State University in 2015, and so he moved there and studied for about a year. Didn't know exactly what he wanted to study, but he had a ton of friends that he was making there, and he seemed to be happy. However, his education began to suffer when he really prioritized his social life more and he ended up failing out of classes that first year. So he moved back in with his grandma and his step-grandfather Bill in 2016. Now his older sister, his half-sister Chloe, was living there as well as her boyfriend and her boyfriend had children who would sometimes come and stay with them too. But back in Tumwater, that is when Logan began to work lots of odd jobs, anything that he could get. He was incredibly hardworking. He wasn't just staying at home and mooching off his family. He went back to his aunt and uncle's farm and he helped out with that. But his family began to notice that he was a bit more withdrawn than normal. By Friday, May 20th of 2016, Logan didn't return home, nor had he contacted his grandmother after going to work the day prior. Now, Jenny had last seen him that May 19th in the morning and hadn't seen him since, so she ended up tracking his cell phone to see where he had been located, and it pinged near Olympia, Washington, which was actually where his mother, Hannah, had moved after going to art school. So it wasn't too far away from Tumwater and she believed he was just visiting his mother and so she left it be. She believed that he would be back soon enough but he still didn't return that May 20th. So that Friday, Jenny decided to go and report him missing. She headed to the Thurston County Police Department and found that they were closed for the weekend. By the time she arrived, it was already shut down. And so Jenny and her husband began to drive out to Olympia, looking around for Logan or his car, and they couldn't find him anywhere. So Jenny had to wait until that next Monday, May 23rd, to ask for the search to begin. During this whole weekend, Jenny still didn't hear from her grandson, nor did he come home. And his mother, Hannah, actually ended up contacting Jenny and saying that she had not been in contact with Logan that entire weekend. So finally, that Monday, the Thurston police were informed of who they were looking for and they would inform her that they had information already. You see, her name was actually on the registration of a car that had been abandoned in the middle of the interstate and impounded. This was the car that her grandson Logan used, and this impounding actually happened all the way back on Friday, May 20th, when Jenny was trying to report him missing at first. Now, this was his black 1996 Chrysler Sebring, and Jenny was informed that it was found on Interstate 5 between Tumwater and Maytown, parked at milepost 92. Though even with finding this car and her grandson not found inside, she continued to try to report her grandson missing and that's when she was told by the sergeant that people were allowed to go missing. So Jenny and Bill went to this impound lot and they found that this car still had the keys in it Logan's wallet, which had his debit card, his driver's license, and $25 in cash. There was also a grocery sack full of snack food in the center console, and his cell phone was there as well. Now, these items were all given to Jenny, and in the trunk, they had found a blanket, clothes, DVDs, and Jenny believed this was for a trip that Logan had planned, which we will get into in just a moment. But Jenny would soon be told that this car had been impounded and so it could not be used as potential evidence. In fact, it was rendered useless. This was yet another delay that could mean the difference between finding this missing boy and never seeing him again. Now, Grandma Jenny would say that Logan moved back in with her and she was often worried about the amount of marijuana he was using because it was causing slight paranoia. She said that Logan was very lost about what he wanted to do with his life at this time, 
but what concerned her most happened the day prior to his disappearance. So let's go back to that Thursday, May 19th, because Logan came into the kitchen that morning talking to his grandma, and he said he was actually going away for the weekend. Now, as an adult, this was more to, you know, inform his grandma that this was happening, keep her updated, than to ask for permission. But Jenny asked what he was going to do, and Logan just kind of stood there and said that he had had an epiphany. When she asked him what it was, he said he couldn't really explain it. And although Logan seemed very nervous about this, Jenny didn't have much time to talk to him. She had to get to work, so she said that they would talk after they got home. By that night, Jenny got home, but Logan never returned home from work, and Jenny thought maybe he had other plans, so she wasn't too worried that night until the next day when he still wasn't home, but then she tracked his phone to his mother's house or near his mother's house, so she felt a bit more relief again. However, after still not hearing from him throughout that whole day, that is when she went to the police. But while the police department wasn't even open, they had gotten 911 calls about this vehicle. During that time, there had been a few calls to police about the car that had been impounded. This was starting on May 20th, the day that Jenny had gone to the police station trying to report her grandson missing and three witnesses had called 911 around 2 p.m. They were all reporting a car that was drifting in the lanes of Interstate 5, going all along the interstate. It didn't appear as though anyone was in the driver's seat. Then it went and it hit the center lane and it basically hit the concrete barrier and finally stopped. However, there was also a statement made from a truck driver who was on the road at that time who said that a Caucasian man with brown or red hair jumped out of the passenger seat once this vehicle stopped and started running towards the woods that were on the side of the interstate. This description obviously didn't match Logan, who was a 6 foot 150 pound biracial 19 year old with black hair and brown eyes. He also normally kept his hair shaved. These were all the tips that were sent in from that highway, but another tip had come in on that same day at about 1 a.m. So in the early morning hours of Friday, about a naked teenager walking alongside of the interstate right next to the woods that hadn't been wearing any pants and he was allegedly reported to be a black man. This teen was not caught or identified and the detective Frank Foley thought that this could have been Logan. Now, after police checked Logan's phone for the day that all the calls were made that his car drifted across the interstate, it showed that he had actually traveled 100 miles south, heading down Interstate 5 from Olympia to Vancouver, Washington, and then going back north towards Olympia once again. And this is where his car would be parked or crashed without Logan inside. So after Logan was identified as the driver of the abandoned car and he was reported missing by his grandmother and these witness statements were obtained, a search was finally conducted where the car had been found. So investigators were finally taking this seriously. The woods nearby the interstate were searched using tracker dogs as well as helicopters brought in to assist. And within a two mile radius, they searched for about six hours, finding no signs of Logan. So it was announced that Logan was an endangered missing who had a severe allergy to peanuts and was supposed to carry an EpiPen, which was not with him at the time. He was known to have a small scar on his left forearm and he was believed to be wearing a black windbreaker jacket jeans a white shirt and possibly nike shoes now logan's uncle mike actually told reporters that the area was very thick and bushy and it had been covered extensively by searchers but nothing had been found but while looking for possible reasons that logan could have been missing possible enemies jenny would tell police that logan had some tension with his sister's boyfriend. So Chloe's boyfriend, who was allegedly named Jake, who also lived with them. Logan allegedly didn't like that he was there and made it known. So investigators decided to question this boyfriend and this 26 year old said that he didn't know anything and he agreed to take a polygraph test. He ended up passing this, but there were rumors that Logan and Jake often had arguments that someone become more physical and that they tried to avoid each other as much as possible. Though because he passed the polygraph test, the investigators decided that this meant that he was not a suspect at all and they released him. But Logan's uncle, Mike, who was married to Mary, who had that farm that Logan often worked on, 
that Uncle Mike was a retired sheriff. And so he began to help in this case from the very beginning and he let detectives know that he believed that Jake, Chloe's boyfriend, could be more involved and he strongly disagreed that they should rule him out just because of a polygraph test. Now, nothing more was done with this Jake, but the boyfriend allegedly had a criminal record which had incidents of assaults as well as domestic violence. Now, Uncle Mike's wife, Aunt Mary, also allegedly believed this as well due to a phone conversation she had had with Logan before he vanished, where Logan was talking about how his sister's boyfriend was moving in his kids, and Mary asked if that was a problem, and Logan said the kids weren't a problem, but Jake was a problem. But because investigators ruled him out, that's kind of where the investigation into this boyfriend ended. The family decided to hire a private investigator at this time, however, they could still find an incredibly small amount of information. They also launched a Facebook page, which is still up today, to keep his name out there. A former classmate of Logan's named Alicia Parrish came forward to tell police that she had seen Logan not long before he vanished and he had come in to give his application for a job. And he seemed nervous, he was acting weird, he didn't act like himself from what she remembered in high school. But it was what was found on Logan's phone before he vanished that was the most concerning. And it turned out that Logan had been on a dating app, he had been talking to this young woman, but he had written to her the week of his disappearance, I hope to survive this week. This was mere days before he was never seen again, and Lieutenant Cameron Simper claimed that Logan never expressed why he said that or why he felt like he wouldn't survive. It would then come out that Logan was in contact with a whole other group of people at this time in his life, and not a lot of people knew about this hangout that he had had. You see, he had recently reached out to his father's side of the family, a father that he had never known, but had family in the area and had never contacted him through his childhood, but he decided to contact his great aunt, Tina, who agreed to meet him. And they had had this meeting that was said to be quite emotional for everyone. They were looking at photographs of his father's side of the family. And Logan allegedly looked at one of the pictures and he said, it feels good to see someone that looks like me. But this meeting wasn't even announced to Grandma Jenny from the mother's side of the family. In fact, relatives on the father's side spoke about that Logan had claimed he wouldn't be telling Jenny because if she found out he was getting to know them, she would be angry. Great Aunt Tina said that they did not meet up again after this, but they did stay in contact for quite a while. Though when reporters would later ask Jenny about not wanting Logan to go to his father's side of the family, she claimed that she would have never kept him from that side. They just never made an effort to see him. But Great Aunt Tina also believes that Chloe's boyfriend, Jake, could be involved in Logan's disappearance. She said that they didn't get along and she thought that he felt unsafe with him. Strangely enough though, a week after he vanished, it was claimed that there was activity on his Facebook page. There was a check-in marked at the Olympia Regional Airport. However, when I went and searched Facebook and I found his page, he had last posted two months prior to his disappearance. It was a picture of scenery and it turned out that this check-in was just a memory from a year prior. Now, his mother Hannah would eventually tell police that before he had vanished, Logan began asking her a lot about his father. She said that she finally showed Logan who he was and it was theorized that he could have gone looking for him. However, his father was still out of the country at this time and would be exceptionally hard to reach, especially when Logan didn't even bring his ID or any cash or anything with him. On July 20th, 2016, two months since Logan had been seen, the community was asked to light a candle for him and place it in their window. Five months since, and a sketch had been released to the public by investigators in Thurston County asking for help and identification. You see, on October 20th, 2016, a young adult male had been located on the Margaret McKinney Campground in Capitol Forest. This was 20 minutes from Tumwater, and he had multiple gunshot wounds and was believed to be between 17 to 25 years old, around six feet tall and 170 pounds. He had no identification on him, but the police sketch looked eerily similar to the missing Logan Schindelman. Many contacted the tip line about these similarities. Was this boy they had been looking for for almost half a year, the boy they had found? 
Well, six days later, it was announced to the public that this body that had been placed there after the murder was 18-year-old Dakota Walker. Thankfully for this victim, two men were arrested and admitted to killing Dakota after they had all been involved in a property and identity theft ring, and Dakota was trying to turn himself in. However, even though Dakota got justice, Logan was still missing. Now, eight months since his disappearance, and a candlelight vigil was held. Two years later, and there was still no word from Logan. In 2018, his case was covered on Discovery TV's Disappeared, and the family then offered a $10,000 reward. The reward money had actually been raised by the community who sold bracelets of Logan's name at the local high school. They held a garage sale with all the proceeds going to the reward. But the airing of this show caught the attention of a woman who didn't even know that she was another witness of this disappearance. You see, she called in this tip that back on May 20th, 2016, that Friday, she had seen Logan's car in the morning when she was headed to work down that Interstate 5. It was southbound, parked on the right shoulder. She saw two Caucasian men and a black man, and she believed that black man was Logan. This stuck in her mind because when she was on her way back home, the car was still parked there and the hood was up. Now, this was the first sighting of these Caucasian men possibly with Logan, but this woman would go into the police department to help with sketches of the men she had seen. She claimed that the one had straight blonde hair and a bowl cut and appeared to be about six foot with a very thin build. He was wearing a tank top and jeans, both of which appeared to be way too small for him. And the other man had shoulder length blonde hair, was wearing a flannel shirt and jeans. So the sketch of one of the men was made public. However, this man wasn't identified, but this was the second witness to have seen a thin Caucasian man in or near the car that day. And still, nobody knew who that was or who Logan could have been with. But in 2019, three years since Logan vanished, another teenager vanished from the area. Matthew Anfelt was 20 years old in Rochester, which was about 20 minutes from where Logan had vanished and lived. Now, Matthew loved freestyle rapping. He would often put songs online under the name Mount Hazy. I remember the beginning when I was winning. Got my mind going crazy and I'm spinning. And on February 28th of 2019, he went bowling with his sister. They returned home. They planned to watch movies. He told her that he was going to go get his phone, but he never returned. And once they realized he was gone, they also realized the neighbors had already called 911 because he had run out to them yelling and screaming that his family had been murdered. So the neighbors believed he was having some sort of mental breakdown. They called the police, but he was already gone by the time they got there. And Matthew was then seen two miles away at the Speedway Grocery. And another 911 call came in from the clerk who said that he was barefoot, he was scared, he had blood around his mouth. He was asking to hide there, but then he took off out the door. Searches were conducted, but there was no sign of Matthew and no more sightings. Friends went to police to inform them that Matthew believed that some people were after him and was mentioning it before this. However, he never gave names or an explanation. His case began to go cold just like Logan's and investigators asked the public to come forward with any sort of information. Then in 2020, four years since Logan was last seen and one year since Matthew was last seen, human remains were found in Longview, Washington. This is around an hour from where Logan's car was abandoned and also an hour from where Matthew vanished. These remains were located near a dock buried in thick blackberry bushes and it was theorized that this could be Logan. Now DNA samples were taken as well as the dental records but there was no matches. So two years later while Logan and Matthew's family held their breaths waiting for answers seeing if this was their family member the facial reconstruction sketch was released and the police claimed that they believed he was most likely Caucasian or Hispanic. Now, this lessened the hope of Logan's family that this was Logan, but it could still be Matthew. And so the cause of death still remained unknown, and he was dubbed the Cowlitz County John Doe. But the next year, a private DNA lab began working on this case and were able to identify family members. These remains turned out to be a man named J. David Figert, who vanished in February 2017, so actually a year after Logan and two years before Matthew. 
and the investigation found no indication that he died as a result of a crime, so the investigation was closed in 2022. But this also meant that Logan and Matthews' families had fewer leads than they believed. Then, the same year this man was identified, in 2022, another teenage boy disappeared from the same area. This was in Olympia, where Logan's phone had pinged that day where his mother lived, and only about six minutes from Tumwater. On August 31st of 2022, a 16-year-old boy named Gabriel Davies was last seen headed to football practice, but then he was seen walking on the side of the road at 5.30 p.m., though he had taken his car to practice. His car was then found abandoned and there was blood seen inside. His phone was also smashed on the ground. This case all sounded a bit too familiar to the case that occurred six years prior with Logan that had never been solved. And so this time investigators were on the search from the beginning. Some theorized that this is because of prior experience that they never found Logan because they didn't start early enough. Others claim that it was due to race because Logan was biracial. Our main goal is to bring Gabriel home to his family. So the vehicle was found on private property on a private drive off of Tilly Road. So the resident there came home from work and saw the vehicle in their driveway and called it in. And this morning, we have received multiple tips, uh, over half a dozen tips uh, with sightings of Gabriel on the Tilly Road area. All of those tips indicate that he was traveling northbound from the 16,100 block and that he was by himself at the time that he was seen. Uh, we have most recently received a tip that he had had been seen entering Miller Trevania State Park. So we have been canvassing the area and checking for residents that may have surveillance or ring doorbells, but we have not found any footage of Gabriel yet. We have not received information that uh, Gabriel is in danger, but it, he is 16 years old and it, this is, behavior is not characteristic of him. So we're very concerned and his family is very concerned as well. So we're taking this very seriously. And we're not going to push this aside as, as a runaway. Uh, we wanna treat this seriously and explore every tip and avenue and to make sure that we bring Gabriel home safely. Either way, the search for Gabriel began immediately. However, two days later on September 2nd, he was found. Now, Gabriel was alive, but this wouldn't be the end of his case. You see, a body had been found while Gabriel was missing, and although it wasn't Gabriel himself, investigators believed he was connected to that dead body. Because during the time Gabriel was missing, police were called to a home for a welfare check. This was in Orting, about an hour from Olympia and where Gabriel vanished. 51-year-old Daniel McCaw would be found in his laundry room, shot and stabbed to death. His home security system actually caught his killers coming in through a dog door. These were two teenage boys. This had been on August 28th, which was three days before Gabriel Davies vanished. And when Gabriel was found, he told detectives that he couldn't remember why he vanished and that he broke his phone because he was afraid of what the police were going to find on it. But the same day that Gabriel was found alive and well, his father called the detective and said that Gabe was involved in the murder of that man because he was approached by bikers who knew the victim and was asked to steal something from him. So that's why the teenagers stuck in. They were attempting to break into his safe, but it went bad. And that his accomplice was his friend, 17-year-old Justin Yoon. They were both arrested and confessed, leading investigators to the firearms they used. It turned out that this victim had once dated Gabriel's mother. It was theorized, though, that Gabriel's disappearance after the murder was a scheme that was created based on his knowledge of Logan's actual disappearance, and that is why it was so eerily similar. Then, in November of 2023, so very recently, a 911 call was made by a hunter who reported human remains being found in Rochester. These would be identified as Matthew Anfeld. He was only a few miles from the store he had last been seen in and the investigation into his death is actually ongoing at this point. And investigators revealed that he, before his disappearance, had actually been attacked two months prior and they don't know who did it that night. There was no police report made, but they wonder if that is the same individual who caused his death because his manner of death has yet to be determined. But thankfully... Matthew can be put to rest. Matthew's mother said, 
It felt like almost five years of emotion. Every emotion I felt the last five years just sort of running through me at one time. I couldn't really cry. I just remember my body starting to shake. To this day, Logan Schindelman has never been found. He would be around 26 today. And in an interview with Dateline, his uncle Mike said, To be gone, it's a loss for everybody, not just his family. Some people who have refused to talk to law enforcement very adamantly, which is unfortunate because they may have information without realizing it. He was hoping with the new sheriff and the new detective on Logan's case that more would be found. So this case is still open, but it is cold. His uncle Mike has said publicly that Logan is welcome to come back with zero explanation. His grandma Jenny said that she wishes she would have known what his epiphany was that morning, that she started to check UFO conferences that were going on in Nevada to see if, you know, the epiphany was connected to that, taking him down that sort of road, but she has never found anything. She feels like his epiphany led him to someone who killed him. His Aunt Mary said that they are all still stuck in some kind of purgatory, stuck in the middle, because they can't grieve without knowing if he's dead, and they can't grieve if he's alive. One small piece of information can break Logan's case wide open, and so I will leave the number to call down below. Please do so, as well as if you know what happened to Matthew Anfelt. But did Logan choose to vanish that day? Who were the other men seen with him in his car and on the side of the highway? Was he having some sort of mental breakdown as it was believed that Matthew was having? Was this an onset of mental illness that can begin in the late teens, early 20s, such as schizophrenia that he didn't know how to handle and was causing this paranoia, possibly even accelerated by the marijuana he was using? And could he still be out there not even knowing what's going on? Could he have gotten lost and that led him to his death? There are so many questions. And what was that epiphany that he was talking about? Is he still out there somewhere? I honestly feel like there is a huge part of me that believes he can still be alive. He may not be doing very well. He may be a homeless man who doesn't understand what's going on, who does suffer from this mental illness, who doesn't even maybe know what happened, how he got there. But I do believe that he can come home one day. And I just think it is so strange that, you know, around this area, there were so many teenagers vanishing and then one that used his disappearance or could have used his disappearance to try to get away with murder. And it just is baffling that his car could be seen with no driver going down the highway, even though his phone was thought to still be in the car because it was tracking him driving down that interstate. Some have theorized that Logan chose to end his own life and that was his epiphany that day. That possibly, you know, he gave the car up to somebody else. I really hope that is not true, but I hope more than anything that this family can get answers and just know and have peace in knowing what happened. So all of the numbers and information for the cases that I talked about will be in the description box below. And don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye. Also make sure to check out Ana Luisa for the best jewelry.